discussing about code onboarding optimization and algorithms development to effectively leverage your high performance computing for your respective research. And we'll also touch on expediting research workflows that will help reduce your processing turnaround time um, so that fewer projects sit idle, which, which obviously will cost you time and money um, from that perspective. So I'll, with no further ado, we'll start the presentation. So if I could have the next slide, please. Now, before we start this, I just want to say there is a quick Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We do encourage questions right throughout, so please don't hesitate to place your questions in the Q&A um, section, and we'll actually re refer to those questions at the end of the presentation and happy to answer any of those, as many of those as we can during the allotted time. But just a quick introduction to Doug Technology. Doug Technology is an access is the global company with, with offices um, in four locations, uh, predominantly Perth, London, Houston, and Kuala Lumpur. So we have a global footprint across four continents. The organization is 19 years young and started and founded in 2003 by Dr. Matthew Lamont and Dr. Troy Thompson out of their backyard shed in Subiaco, where they developed an enhanced decision support system for the oil and gas industry um, that was instrumental um, in seismic processing in that space. You'll be happy to know that Doug designs, owns and operates some of the largest and greenest supercomputer installations on Earth. And we'll, and we'll touch on more about that as we move forward. Um, some of the product lines that you may be familiar with Doug is we, we, we offer high performance computing as a service, and that's gonna be predominantly the focus of our discussion today. But we also offer software products and services and obviously services right across the spectrum, across a number of sectors. We also have a very strong remit um, on research and development. And we have a large team of data scientists and big data experts that support all our clients right across the board, across all of the sectors. Um, I wanna to touch on our areas of focus um, here at Doug Technology. And the first one is sovereign capability. So you're happy to know that all of our Australian-based clients, data sits here, here in Australia in our supercomputer right here in Western Australia. Um, and, that's, and that's something we're very, very proud of, um, especially in light of the sovereign data capability focus that we have in the country. We also offer green computing, which has a direct impact on our ESG footprint. So Doug did develop a patented oil immersion cooling technology that allowed us to save up to 51% on power, energy and associated costs compared to traditional data centers. So not, not only did it give Doug a global ESG footprint, but it also allowed our clients to take advantage of that, of that as well. And we have a number of examples of clients um, who, who have supported our initiative and our ambition moving forward. The third focus is on data and cybersecurity, probably needs no introduction, but allows you to have confidence mm -hmm. um, that we data and cybersecurity is our highest priority here at Doug uh, and one that we're extremely proud of. Um, in, terms of, in terms of some of the work that we undertake on behalf of our key clients across a number of sectors. We also have an Australian-based de dedicated high-performance computing support team. Um, so this is a team based right here in our office here in Doug Technology. Um, they support all of our clients with onboarding, code optimization, algorithms development, predictive analytics, and modeling, if that's what our clients require. So they are a, a very unique and, and differential point of difference for our organization. And the fifth point that I want to touch on is domain specific expertise. So an, a number of years ago, purely based on demand, we expanded our footprint beyond just oil and gas to have a series of life science, health and medical clients amongst other clients in other diverse sectors. Um, so we have a lot of domain specific expertise in our high performance computing support team. Um, so they will work closely, be your point of contact um, and support you to make sure that your, your jobs and your projects run as smoothly as possible uh, from a high performance computing perspective. Thanks, Nathan. Next slide. Um, I touched initially on our, on our global footprint, but I just wanted to share with you is that we, we, we have we have a facility in Houston, Texas that services our US market. We have an office in London that looks after the European clients. We also have another facility in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, that services Asia Pacific and Perth is our head office. So we are a truly global organization headquartered in Australia. And that's something that we're, we're extremely proud of. 
And the other thing I wanted to mention from this slide is we have a connection to, to ARNet. So for those um, participants on the call today that are linked to our Australian universities, that'll be that'll be great news for all of you in terms of in terms of our ability to to transfer process uh, data on your behalf in line with your projects. Thanks, Nathan. So this is the reason for this masterclass was based on demand and what we're actually seeing with all of our life science clients, both in the health and medical space, is that <clears throat> the quantity of the data and the number of the number and diversity of data sources, um, you know, is gaining complexity um, in the life science industry, and it's increasing at an unprecedented rate. So researchers are really racing to keep up with the rapid evolution and digitization of our industry. And some of the things that, you know, that we're encountering is more algorithms, uh, more methodologies required, more data throughput, um, more analytical ch challenges that require, you know, high performance computing support, more computational and storage restrictions that we're confronted with, but also a real need to accelerate the translation of your research, but also in, in many cases to accelerate the commercialization of your intellectual property. And I think this is gonna be a valuable uh, masterclass for those who find themselves um, in those research translation and commercialization roles as well. Thanks, Nathan. Um, and then finally, you know, some of the common problems that we hear from all of our clients is about, you know, workflows um, being too long or, or, or I've run out of space or I'm having trouble scaling up or the workflow, you know, is taking, um, is taking up too much, too much memory and so on. So with no further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Stuart Midgley, who will take you through some specific examples and an introduction into high performance computing. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Colin. Uh, great introduction. So again, I'd like to reiterate to everyone on this call, um, please feel free to post your questions and answers as I go through this. Uh, it'll be a reasonably um, rapid pace. There's a bit to get through and there'll be a, hopefully a very informative example of um, coming up. So first of all, I guess the, the first question is, what is high performance computing? Uh, most people think that they've got a big desktop un, you know, underneath their desk or a fat laptop processing their data. Um, high performance computing is a very, very broad field. Um, it involves massive amounts of compute and fast networks and storage. Parallel programming comes under high performance computing. A lot of people who are in high performance computing do a lot of system administration and have a vast amount of network and security knowledge. Uh, it's about extensive infrastructure to enable, enable large scale computing. So in our case, you know, you're thinking thousands and ten, tens of thousands of servers, which equates to tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of laptops, all operating together as a single system. It is a multidisciplinary field, it brings it in digital electronics, computer architecture, system software, programming languages, um, algorithms, computational techniques. Um, traditionally, it's been the domain of physicists and chemi quantum chemists and those sorts of people, uh, but it has been rapidly changing in the last sort of decade. Next slide. So really what Doug does is help solve some of these problems. Uh, we can provide high performance computing on demand uh, where you can come onto a platform, run a diverse range of workflows on a diverse range of hardware uh, and have it all available in one place. Uh, we have what is in essence unlimited amounts of storage. Um, we grow our storage system seamlessly. Um, so as it starts to approach a, a threshold, it just continuously grows. We also work very hard to make sure people's pipelines run efficiently. Uh, this may seem a bit odd for a cloud provider, but we do actually pride ourselves on helping people run as efficiently as possible on the platform. Um, we want to see you successful. And the way that we achieve that is to help you get up and running as well as possible. And we want to expedite your research workflows. So we want to build the workflows for you, help you, assist you so that you can just get on land data and run jobs as quick as possible. And ultimately, this saves you the most amount of time. I mean, if you spend two weeks trying to get a workflow going, um, that's two weeks you don't have processing data, whereas we might be able to get it going inside a day and uh, leave you to processing the data straight away. So our HPC ex experts um, have got a vast amount of experience and a very large range um, of life sciences tools and applications and frameworks. Um, today, we're going to be talking about Bowtie 2, uh, but 
as a, if you have a look at that map, there, there probably isn't too many toolkits we haven't played with, don't have expertise in. Um, so just, just a few examples here on this slide. Okay, so HPC practicalities. I guess that the hardest thing that we see people um, who turn up um, to our facility and, and get running is that they're not really ready to keep the machine fed. High performance computing systems can crunch through a lot of work and they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, take no holidays. Um, and so you really need to be ready to keep it fed. You need to have a large amount of data and a large amount of work to keep up to it. And often you achieve this by scaling up your problems. So rather than dealing with a sample at a time, be prepared to deal with 10,000 samples. Rather than dealing with a certain resolution, be prepared to double or triple the resolution you want to look at your results. Uh, be ambitious. You know, it's a big computer. Uh, it can really crunch through a lot of work. So be prepared to start tackling some really interesting and curly problems. And another thing which we focus on is security. No matter what happens with what you do on Doug, it's all secure. And that will unfortunately necessitate a, jumping through a few small security hoops. Our support team's there to help. Um, we, are, we do have to be secure. Um, so please work with us and we'll minimize all those problems for you. A few other practicalities, all HPC systems are Linux based. Um, that's been the way for the last sort of 20 plus years uh, and it's continuing. So all of the Doug systems will be Linux based. Um, globally, all large scale compute systems are Linux based and nearly all the software that's used um, in the life sciences sector has probably come from Linux based environments, you know, whether it be Python, um, GitHub, uh, GitLab, uh, whether we're looking at Jupyter Notebooks, all of those things are in, originated on Linux hardware. That means you're going to need to know Secure Shell. So Secure Shell or SSH is the most common way to access HPC facilities. Uh, in terms of what we do, it's also how you access our remote desktop. So everything, all access to Doug's facility is via the Secure Shell. Uh, whether it be remote access or just terminal access, so be familiar with that. And when, again, our support team's there to help. The other thing about high performance computing systems is this thing called a batch scheduler. So nearly all workflows run on the batch scheduler or the queue. So that's where you package up your work into a job and you give it to the queuing system or the batch scheduler and the batch scheduler then runs it on your behalf on the big machine on the background. Commonly, this is slow. And certainly in our case at Doug, we run Slurm. Uh, if you go to most of the facilities globally, they're probably running Slurm. Of course, as I've just mentioned, you're going to be packaging up your workflow into what's called a job. A job is nearly always a bash script. So you are going to need a little bit of familiarity with bash. Again, our support team's there to help you. Probably the, the biggest benefit of high performance computing system or high performance computing as a service is its ability to get through concurrent work. Most HPC facilities are now clusters and a cluster is a collection of computers linked together with a high performance network and storage system. Each of those computers can work on independent work. You can link them all up and use multiple computers as a single, in essence, compute engine um, that takes a little more work, but typically in the life sciences, we see each machine operating independently on an independent piece of data and then running multiple instances of that data across the system. So, for example, you might have different input um, files and you run a different input file on each server. Then at the end of all of that, you bring the results together into a common um, output, research output. So because these systems are designed to run concurrent workflows, you need to look for parts of your workflow that are dealing with independent pieces of data. So think about the same computation on different input, running the same workflow on different samples. Parts of your workflow may be able to be run in parallel. And certainly that's the case with Bowtie 2, which we're going to uh, showcase shortly. Um, to work out whether your code is able to be run in parallel or, or can utilize multiple threads, you need to read the manual. Uh, again, our support team can provide advice in that space. We've obviously worked with a lot of the workflows so we can uh, help you with that decision. Okay, so we've sort of gone over a little bit about what high performance computing is about. Now I just wanna really dive into an example. 
Um, so this example is on bow tie two. Um, nearly, well, I guess the first, as we've sort of seen, the first steps in nearly every next generation sequencing analysis pipeline is to map sequencing reads to a reference genome. We're going to do this today using Bowtie 2, uh, using our HPC. Now, I'm not going to do a live demo, but it will hopefully feel like a live demo uh, and look like a live demo. So Bowtie 2 is a package that's widely used. We are going to use example data um, available on the internet, so you can take what we do today home and practice it on your laptop and on your HPC facility or come and talk to us and run the one hours. Next slide, please. Right, so what does Bowtie do? Bowtie 2 do? Bowtie 2 takes a Bowtie 2 index and a set of sequencing read files and outputs a, string, a set of alignments in SAM format. So it's going to take all these small pieces of a genome and uh, align it to a reference. Next slide, please. Bowtie 2's performance um, can be dictate can be done in many ways. Well, can be uh, optimized in many ways. It has built in um, the ability to run on multiple threads, so you can scale up on your computer, on your laptop. That might be four threads. On our HPC facility, on a single server, you might be able to run on 60 to 68 or 128 threads. Each of the threads runs on a different processor or core on the server. And all threads find alignments in parallel. So each thread takes a piece and aligns it to the scaffold. Increasing alignment throughput by approximating a multiple number of threads. So as I said, you get each piece and you align it to the scaffold and you do that independently on lots of little calls on the CPU. As we'll show you in practice, speed up is somewhat worse than linear. So by linear speed up, we mean if you double the number of cores, you get double the performance. In Bowtie's two case, that isn't quite true, and we'll show that in a sec. So not only can we run it threaded on a single server, but we can also run multiple samples in parallel on the one node. So if Bowtie 2 doesn't scale to fill up the whole node, we can run two samples or four samples on that one node to utilize the hardware efficiently. And then we can use multiple nodes to run in parallel for much greater throughput. So let's get started. So we've got a terminal window here. Um, this is probably going to be your gateway to an HPC system is this little black window with white text. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is we've got a fictional user, Mr. Douglas McLeod. He's sitting on his laptop, as you can see there, it's Douglas at local, and he wants to copy data to our facility. He's got all the data locally, and in this case, it's Bowtie 2 demo data, but imagine this is any data. He's got it sitting on his laptop, and he wants to copy it to our facility. Next slide. Copying can be as simple as running rsync. So you're going to rsync the Bowtie2 demo directory, and you're going to land it on Doug in a particular directory. In this case, it's slash data over West Sunny Douglas's stuff. You can see here the output of an rsync running. Copies all the files over. Speed up is one, no compression. Funnily enough, all the data was already compressed. Okay, so you've copied the data on. Now you will have noticed there that we just did rsync Doug colon. Well, that's made possible by the fact that we've set up our SSH config file. If we go and look at Douglas's SSH config file, you'll see there that we've defined a host called Doug. And that then has all the config to get connected to our facility. It has a host name, it has the user's name, it has what port to connect on, and it has this thing called a proxy jump. The proxy jump is where we effectively apply most of the security. This is a pass-through box, which enforces security, checks out who you are, authenticates you, and makes sure you are who you say you are before you get onto your dedicated head node. All of that is captured in the SSH config file. This means that you can just do SSH Doug. You issue the command, it then prompts you for a password. When you connect to our facilities, you are going to need both an SSH key and an SSH password. Again, we've got instructions on how to do this. We have um, a support team sitting there ready to help you. So hopefully this will not be too difficult. 
As you can see now, we are on our dedicated head node, PVNC0004. Okay, so Douglas, who was on his local machine, is now on the Doug McLeod machine. He can now CD to his working directory, slash so data over with Sunny, Douglas's stuff, Bowtie 2 demo. We're now in the directory where we copied all of our files. We can quickly find all those files just doing a search or an LS. And as we can see, we've got the full Bowtie 2 demo data set now on Doug McLeod. Okay, so we're up and running. We've got some data on, we've logged in. Now what? Okay, well, first of all, Douglas is a bioinformatician. He's not an expert in Linux and not really great at installing software. So he jumps on the Slack channel that we provide and says, hey guys, I'm up and running. I need Bowtie 2. Sitting on the other end is a guy called Su Yen. Su Yen is one of our bioinformatics um, experts. First of all, Su Yen will give an introduction, talk about how the system's set up um, and provide you with some general information so that you can go back and refer to it when you're operating your project. Next slide. Douglas says, look, I need Bowtie 2. Can you build it for me? So he says, sure, here it is. Sets it up, tells Douglas how to access it and how to get up and running. So suyen has gone and built the software, installed it for you in your area, so it's specific to you told you how to modify your bash RC file. So this is the file that bash the shell sources when you start up so that you can access software. And you can see there, there's this module use, uh, data over West Sunny software modules, you source it, and then you've got Bowtie 2. That's what happened within a few hours, Douglas is up and running with Bowtie 2. Douglas goes in and modifies his bash RC according to the instructions that Suyen provides goes and adds the line to the bash RC. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yep. Okay, so because we didn't re-log in, we're gonna do the module add Bowtie 2 ourselves. So if we logged in the next time, it will be available. So we do module add Bowtie 2, next slide which Bowtie 2, so we find out where the binary is installed. And you can see here that it's installed in your project, or in, in this case, in Douglas's project, under a directory called SW, and this is version 2.4.2. Right, so we're in the data directory, so we're in Bowtie 2 demo. Now we're gonna run Bowtie 2, just on the login node, just to make sure it works. So we type in the command, we provide the input files, and away we go. Bowtie 2 sets up, starts running, and six minutes and 49 seconds later, it's completed. So it's aligned this data to the scaffold. By default, Bowtie 2 uses one thread, so one CPU core. But if we go and look on this head node, it's got 40 cores. So it's a large desktop system. So now we're gonna tell Bowtie 2, let's use 40 threads. So we pass in an extra option minus P40 and run exactly the same command. It runs and 34 seconds, 37 seconds later, it's completed. So we've gone from six minutes 40-ish down to 37 seconds. So it's running a lot quicker. The real question is, what's the fastest? As we alluded to earlier, Bowtie 2 doesn't quite scale linearly as you add threads. This is a common characteristic of HPC systems. Threading comes with an overhead. So as you add more threads, the overheads go up and eventually the overheads will dominate. So as a good HPC practitioner, we do a scaling test. We plot the speed versus as we add cores. And as you can see here at 16 threads, which is that 36 seconds, it's the same speed, well, 40 threads is slightly slower than 16 threads. So the curve actually turns around, around 32 threads. It's linear to about 16, and then it starts to slow down. Next slide, please. So what does this really mean? Well, 
if you consider that you've got 5,000 samples and each sample is taking 30 seconds, if you were running that on a single machine, that would take 1.7 days. If it was a bigger sample, maybe the sample takes 30 minutes to process. That would be three and a half months on a single machine. So with 5,000 samples, the same workflow, you could go from 1.7 days to three and a half months to process that data. This is really where an HPC system comes in. You can buy a server with 40 cores and run them one after the other. But really, we want to run them in parallel. So to do that, as I alluded to before, we're going to use this package called Slurm. Slurm used to mean something, but now it's just a, a name of a product. It's a batch scheduler that most HP systems are now running. It's a workflow manager. You submit your jobs to Slurm. When you submit your job to Slurm, it comes with a resource request. So you tell Slurm what, how much memory you want, how many cores you want, if you want GPUs, how many GPUs you want. And it makes sure that your job runs on a node with those resources. Your job is in essence a shell script. It captures the commands that you would normally type at the command line, puts it into a text file, and then you submit that to Slurm. Slurm, if you want very complicated workflows, allows dependency. So you can say only run this job when this job completes successfully. Or run, if the job fails, run this job to clean up. So we, use, we have written a little tool called RJS, um, Run Job Slurm, to help you submit large numbers of jobs to Slurm. RJS is a Doug specific tool. Uh, but it includes some really useful features. It timestamps your job logs. It provides some information about how much network and I.O. you did. It does these things called arrays, which we'll show you shortly. It support allows you within your group to set job priorities. It specifies a standard log naming convention. And it allows you to hold a job when you submit it to hold it to run at a later date. So it's got all these little features inside and again, to find out more, you jump on the Slack channel and you ask Sue Yen. Okay, so we've got this job. We're gonna run bow tie now in a job. So we've got this file called run underscore bt.job. It's a shell script, it's got bin bash. Then we tell Slurm what we need. In this case, we're only gonna give it a name and we're gonna say what queue to run on. Over West Sunny, that's the queue that this project has been allocated. Inside that script, we have module add bowtie2. So that then sources the information to run bowtie2. Then we have our bowtie2 command. And in this case, we're going to run on 16 threads. We then do rjs run bt.job and we get a job ID 47296887. That job is now running and we can run SQ to have a look at that job. And there you can see it. It's on the partition over West Sunny. It's got the name Bowtie2 and it's in the R state, which means it's been running and it's been running for 22 seconds on PNOD 2-20-40. So that's our job up and running and it's running on the back backend um, HPC system. We can go and look at the log file for that job using another Doug specific command called JLS. And you type in JLS and the job ID that Slurm gave you. Next slide, please. And you can see the job log. So here you see the job start, you see the normal bow tie output, but on the left, you have timestamps next to it. So you can see exactly when each line of the output came out. We can also see where this job log file is. So if you look at the bottom there, it shows you what file it's looking at. So bowtie 2.047296887. So that is the job running on the system, running a single sequence. Of course, as we indicated, the power of the HPC system is to be able to run multiple sequences at once. So we're now going to write a little script to download more sequences. So we have this little script. It's going to start up lots of W gets and download all the data from the UK. Away it goes. All the data is now hopefully downloaded. If we go and look in the data directory, the Bowtie 2 demo directory, we now have lots of different sequences, seven of them to be specific. 
Right, so now we want to run this job on the cluster and we want to process all seven sequences at once. So we're going to build a new job script, run underscore bt underscore batch dot job. We're going to use 16 CPUs or 16 cores and four gigs of memory. That's how much CPUs and core each job is going to take. So we tell Slurm about that. So we have our name, we have our queue. We have this thing called a schema, which I'll touch on shortly. We then have CPUs and we then have memory. Compare that to our previous job script. We've added a few extra resource requirements and then we've encoded into the Bowtie2 command some parameters to tell Bowtie2 how to run. In this case, we're capturing the number of CPUs to run on. We also are building in this thing called sample ID. So when Bowtie2 runs, it's going to need a shell variable called sample ID, which will tell it which input file to load up and which output file it's going to produce. All of these are provided by the schema file. So the schema file is a simple text file. It's got a number down the left, which is in essence the task number, task one, task two, task three, task four, and what sample ID to run. When, can you just go back please? When this script runs, sample ID will be set to one of those lines. So the schema file is a text file which sets those variables, one for each task. So when task one runs, can we go back please? Uh, forward, sorry. When task one runs, sample ID will be SRR0302522. When sample seven runs, it's gonna be SRR030258. So each one of those lines becomes an independent task to run on the cluster. Now we can submit that job. Again, we get a single job ID. We again type in SQ to look at the queue and see what's running. And look at that. We now have seven tasks running independently. We've got four tasks on PNOD 1-15-26, and we've got three tasks on PNOD 1-16-52. And on the right, you can see the job ID, task one, task two, task three, four, five, six, and seven. They are all running at the same time. We are running on four nodes, four on one node and three on the other. Each job is using 16 cores and four gigs of memory. So let's have a look at this PNOD 11526. It has 68 cores and 128 gigs of memory. If each task is taking 16 cores, that adds up and we've got four on node, that gives you 64 cores. So we've got four cores sitting idle. Yeah, it's a little bit of a waste, but at the end of the day, we are now using this node efficiently. We are running Bowtie 2 in its most efficient way, i.e. 16 cores. And now we've packed the node with as many jobs as we can. Every single job finishes in about a bit over two and a half minutes. So all of a sudden, we're now running seven tasks and all of them finish inside two minutes 55. So from two minutes 55, after we've submitted those seven tasks, we've got seven results. We haven't run them one after the other. So again, we come back to this scaling graph. We ran on 16 threads, because that was what we've deemed to be the most efficient way to run bow tie. However, we could have run on 32. It would have run faster. Next slide, please. Let's do that. We take the same script, we modify the name. So we put, instead of 16 threads, we're changing it to 32 threads, and we tell each job to use 32 cores and eight gigs of memory. So we think, okay, we're doubling the threads, let's double the memory, let's just be safe. The rest of the script doesn't change because we were setting our number of threads to bow tie based on the slurm variable and we've changed the slurm variable. The schema doesn't change. We're still running the same seven files. All we're doing is running them on more threads. We submit the job, get a new job ID. 
We can check it out on the queue. And now you can see we've got seven jobs running again. This time, we're only getting two jobs per node. And that's because each job is using double the number of cores. So now we've got two jobs per node. We can go and look at the output of all of our jobs. We just look at the bottom, find out how long they've been running. And we see that when we use 16 threads, they all the jobs completed in two minutes 55. When we use 32 threads, they completed in one minute 41. Not half the time. So now we've got this trade-off and we can pick this trade-off. Do we run optimally and optimize for price, which is the two minutes 55? Or do we just want the fastest result to meet a tight deadline? And remember, you know, in two minutes, probably doesn't make a lot of difference. But if this goes from, say, two days to one day, then you may seriously consider running it on more threads to get it through faster. And this is the trade-off that you can make on an HPC system. You can run the single application faster or run more of them. So let's do the mathematics. If we had 5,000 samples, each taking 30 seconds, 1.7 days. If we run four samples per node and we can get 12, 150 nodes, we can run all 5,000 samples in under three minutes. Again, on a facility like we have, you can get 12,000, oh, sorry, 1,250 nodes, and you can run all of those samples in under three minutes. If those samples take 30 minutes each, and this is the run where it was going to take three and a half minutes, oh, sorry, three and a half months, we could run three minutes times 60, because it's 60 times larger, three hours per job. If you run four samples per node, i.e. 16 threads, and each one takes three hours, then we could do 5,000 samples on 1,250 nodes in three hours. So this is a sample, which if you ran it on your big end desktop, under your desk might take three and a half months. You could have the whole lot done in three hours. That's the power of concurrency. That's what happens when you tune the code and then you run as many instances of it as you possibly can. It's the ability to pump through lots of samples. So coming back to my initial comment, you need lots of work. You need to turn up. I mean, 5,000 samples are only going to keep us busy for three hours. The other thing that we can do is that we can go back and historically look at our jobs. And in this case, we can have a look in this example at the memory usage. We requested four gigs on 16 threads. We requested eight gigs on 32 threads. How much did we actually use? Well, it turns out if you look at that max RSS, the jobs only used 100 meg. So we requested four gig but I only used 100 meg, that's fine. We could have requested 200 meg just to be safe and, and ran in that, um, but we wouldn't have packed any more on a node because we used up all the cores. For the other samples, so if you go back, for the other samples, so where we requested 32 cores, it did use more memory. So bow tie was running slower than 16 cores and using more memory. Still not a lot of memory, still easily fits on the node but it was using more memory. Next slide, please. So just a recap. We logged on to our secure HPC facility. We securely copied data onto the platform. We produced a scaling plot for our application to find out where it runs most efficiently. We determined the optimal number of threads to run on. And we constructed a simple job which is tunable to adjust the number of threads, et cetera. We set up that job to run with multiple samples simultaneously. So we've done both types of optimization. We've optimized for threads, and now we've optimized for samples. We ran multiple samples per compute node, and lo and behold, we got our data out as fast as possible, produced great science faster than ever before. And of course, in theory, this gives you a paper and hopefully lots of citations. Now, you might think getting 80 citations in nine months is a bizarre thing to say, 
But what I've just talked about is literally what we did for a customer. We got them using a huge number of threads. We got them being able to process thousands of samples at once. And they got a paper out two years ahead of schedule. And in nine months, they had 80 citations. So that is an actual real life example that we did for someone. Some other real life examples that we can talk about uh, is a workflow by Dr. David Martino from TKI, where again, he took a, uh, an ATAC sequence pipeline uh, for end-to-end -end quality control processing of ATAC sequences and DNA sequence data. Dr. Martino was struggling to get this full pipeline up and running on internal um, systems. Came along to Doug, we helped him out, got him up and running, built the whole workflow for him. You know, he gave us, told us what he wanted to do and told us the workflow. We then built the environment for him and are now able to just run results through it. Another example is Dr. Sam Buckbury from TKI. Similar sort of story. Came along with a custom bioinformatics pipeline, um, was unable to get the desired throughput on an in-house system. Again, because we have thousands of nodes, um, we're able to push those through uh, very rapidly. So we designed a simple user-friendly workflow. Uh, we also managed to optimize certain components of that workflow and get the compression um, of certain files running about 50 times faster. And through all of this, we got a 2x speed up, and then we we're able to process hundreds of samples at the same time. So this took a, uh, workflows which were running in over 20 hours down to 10 hours and then running lots of them at once. Uh, a non-research based one was a, a company called Genius Genomics. Again, a similar sort of story. They wanted to analyze more than a thousand whole genome sequences. Each sample was taking two to three days. So we got the uh, pipeline up and running. We reduced their memory usage so that we could pack nodes really efficiently. Uh, and then we took their runtime from 30 hours to 30 minutes. And then we're able to scale a large number of samples efficiently. So this is some of the work we do for people. Uh, we, we take their large problems and we work on them with the customer and we make sure that they run efficiently on the platform to give you much better output, much better outcomes. And I guess this is captured up in, in some work or a comment from uh, Harry Perkins, uh, where they said, you know, they, they want to trust, we built them a, a bespoke system, a bespoke HPC solution, and we give their researchers quick and easy access to high performance computing. In this case, our storage system made an enormous difference to how quickly they can process data. So our full solid state disk vast storage system allowed them to do certain IO operations that they previously couldn't. And the nice thing about that is they came out and said, you know, we're trusting the technology to the experts. You know, they want to get on and do science. They want to do life-saving research. They don't want to be fiddling around trying to get HPC scripts and writing Slurm scripts and getting all this stuff functional. They want to leave that to people who know how to do it and who are efficient and good at it and get on with their research. So that's about all we have for you today. Uh, I know there's been some questions coming up um, in the Q&A. Certainly, if anyone wants to ask more, feel free. Well, well, thanks, Jude, very much appreciated. And, uh, and you're right, there's been a number of questions. So we'll try and get through them as many as we can in the time allotted. Um, so very encouraging to receive a number of questions that we have. So uh, the first question we've got is, what is the minimum criteria or standard for high performance, for a high performance computer system? I'm using a MacBook Pro 2.9 gigahertz quad core Intel Core i7. Is this good enough for large data analysis? I'll throw that one back to you, Stu. I mean, it's a pretty sexy looking MacBook Pro, I must say. But at the end of the day, it depends on how much data you have. I mean, how long is it taking you to get through your workflow? If your workflow is, you know, you want to process hundreds or thousands of samples and each workflow is taking days, then no, it's not good enough. Come onto an HPC system where you can process them all at once and potentially run a lot faster. Our systems, start at about 64 cores. So if you've got an application that can scale in threads or you can run lots of instances at the same time, then you'll go 64 times faster per machine. Um, so it's a very different style of environment. 
The other thing that happens is your MacBook Pro hasn't been designed for heavy duty compute. It might be good enough to tinker with and play with things, but thermally it's not designed for that. It's not, the cooling's not designed to have the CPU running at 100% for days on end. Um, it, you might wanna shut the screen and take it home. While you do that, your compute stops. Um, whereas in an HPC system, you can put it on the system, go home, check it from home, come back the next day, and you know it's a remote system that you don't have to worry about. And that it's a remote system that every component of it is designed for compute. So the, we have small customers, we have large customers. And we have customers who come on and just want to run a single workflow that you know was taking 30 hours. They want to run it a bit faster, but they just want that flexibility to not have to have it running and their fans whirring under their desktop, under their desk, being noisy. All the way to customers that turn up with tens of thousands of samples they want to process. So I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Drew. And I'll encourage people, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to continue to send them through on the Q&A on the, on the Q &A button. Um, we welcome all these questions. But the next question from one of the um, masterclass participants is on the issue of sovereign data security, how is your customer's data stored and secured? Um, I'm happy to answer this one. So, so, so we store the data in a secure facility and it's encrypted at rest. And all, access, and all access to the cloud is via a secure, a secure pathway and a process. And I suppose this is a good opportunity also to share that we have um, ISO certification for 9001 for quality management system here at Duck Technology, but we also have ISO 27001 for information security certification as well. Um, so I think, you know, with the, the caliber of the clients that we also work with here at Duck, I think, as I mentioned in my introduction, um, security is one of our number one priorities here um, and something that we know that we take very seriously. And we also know that we, we give a lot of confidence to clients um, in working with us to ensure both um, you know, data storage, but also data security. I've got another question here, and I think this one might be um, relevant for Stuart to respond to. Um, one of the participants asked Stuart, running bioinformatics workflows on supercomputers is quite energy intensive. What systems do you have in place to minimize the associated carbon footprint? Yeah, I mean, you touched on this earlier. So we run some of the greenest high performance computing systems globally. And you can see it in this photo. And, and if I move the right way, you can see it in my picture behind us. That's a picture of our data center here in Perth. So all of our computers live in fluid. And we do this to save 51% of our energy. Um, so not only do our facilities run entirely on um, green energy, as in we buy green energy, um, we also save half that energy compared to a normal data centre. So that's half the number of solar panels, half the wind turbines, et cetera, half the battery, if that's the case. Um, and so we, we pride ourselves on, on operating these super energy efficient data centres, um, which surprisingly makes a huge difference when you're trying to run large GPUs. Uh, not only are we running them energy efficiency, we can run energy heavy equipment. So the fluid is excellent at getting heat off equipment uh, and off those GPUs. So we can run lots of GPUs um, flat out 24 hours a day, seven days a week without them crashing. Um, and, and that's what a lot of our customers want. They want reliability performance. Thanks, Drew. Another question I've I received from the from the Q and A um, chat group is: Can we schedule a tour of your high performance computing facility? Um, the answer, the short answer is yes. We can do both face to face and virtual tours. Um, it's something that we do encourage with most of our with most of our clients that do have the ability either to actually see the facility, but you know, you know, and we do have information that we do share with all of our clients, both around high performance computing and our patented oil immersion cooling technology um, that we're very, very proud of. Um, and, you know, and, you know, when people are looking for, you know, partners that not only provide sovereignty, but security, but also um, a green ESG footprint, um, I think that puts us in a in very good light in that perspective. But the short answer is yes, please don't hesitate to reach out and we're more than happy, happy to accommodate um, any of our any of our stakeholders with a, a guided tour, either that be in person or virtually for those of you who, who aren't located um, in Western Australia as well. Um, another question that's just come through here is um, researchers in life sciences often face 
data storage constraints. How is Doug solving these issues? I'll, I'll ask you, Stuart, to answer that one, please. Yeah, I mean, this is an interesting question and we see this a lot in the life sciences community. Um, we've made very careful decisions about the products that we have in our facility. And one of them is around our storage system. I mentioned it while I was talking that we run this product called Vast Storage. Um, it's full solid state disk. Uh, it's designed to be hammered by lots of compute nodes. But more importantly, it doesn't matter what type of IO you do. It doesn't matter whether you're doing small reads and writes or doing large streaming reads and writes. Um, you know, the large streaming tends to be the physicists and chemists. The small IO tends to be our bioinformatics and life sciences workloads. Most of the HPC platforms are designed for the physicists and chemists over there, whereas what we've got works equally well for everyone. Um, it delivers supreme performance. Um, it doesn't matter how you hit it. It doesn't matter how many nodes you hit it with. It just soaks it all up and runs. And so we've seen this make very, very large differences to how people run. Um, you know, those millions of small files, not a problem. We don't need you to tar them up. We don't need you to compress them. Just land them on the file system and run with them. Um, so this allows people to build easier workflows. It allows people just to have directories, millions of files in them and just use them how they want. They do not need to change their way of operating from their desktop to our platform. Thanks, Stuart. And probably we've got time for one more question. Um, probably a question I'll direct to you, Stuart, is, and, and the question came from a member of the audience who stated, HPC support is crucial to me as a researcher and large cloud providers are not well equipped to deploy my workflows efficiently. Could you elaborate on what you're doing in this regard to help researchers better deploy their pipelines on your HPC infrastructure? I guess what we are, here at Doug, what we try to do is make our facility and our staff feel like part of your facility and your staff. Uh, you can jump on a Slack channel, you can ring us up, you can get on an email and speak to someone and get your problem solved. Uh, that person is usually that really nice intersection. So people like Sue Yen and myself are people who, come from academic backgrounds. I've got a PhD in quantum physics and Sue Yen's a mathematician slash computer visualization person. Um, we've got those really nice science backgrounds, but actually we're super interested in IT. So we've been the geeks who like to fiddle and play and with computers to solve science problems. Um, and so we're there to help. I mean, we, we generally get in and can understand the maths you're doing and we're interested in what you're doing but we're not interested in doing research. We want to help people use the big computer. And really, when people come onto the platform, that's what they appreciate the most. They appreciate someone who knows how to get Bowtie 2 run. They know, you know, who knows how to get AlphaFold running, who's done it before, seen it. You know, they don't necessarily, uh, not necessarily an experts on how to use Bowtie or AlphaFold for your science, but they know how to get it running. They know how to solve the problem. They act as that interface between the scientists and the computing backend. And that expertise is what most people really appreciate when they come on the platform. Um, some people are fine, they can get up and running on their own and, and that's, that's fine, they don't need any help. But a lot of people just need some of those interesting, difficult IT problems solved, like dependencies. I've got version 2.4.2 of Bowtie, I need GCC this, I need Python that. Um, I need NumPy this, you know, just getting all of those little intricate details sorted out, installed and integrated properly is what our team's expert at. Uh, thanks, Drew. Very, com very comprehensive. And with that, um, I'm conscious of, of time for the audience, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you very much for your participation today and your generous time. Also, a sincere thank you for all the questions. Apologies that we weren't able to get through all the questions today, but we will circle back and answer any of those questions we weren't able to discuss on the masterclass. But um, please feel free to reach out for any support that you require. And on, on behalf of Doug Technology, I wanted to wish you all the very best in your, med in your medical research projects. And like we said, we're very much here to help. And I hope you found this masterclass very valuable, enjoyable, and and you took away some key learnings as well. With that, I wish you guys a fantastic day and the remainder of the week ahead. And we look forward to talking to you all very, very soon. Bye for now. See you all. Bye-bye.